Hello there. So here we are with part two of a three-parter on the Battle of Waterloo, 1815. This part deals mainly with the type of troops that Napoleon commanded and the way that he will fight those troops on his way to try and gain European dominance, or maybe not. You might want to miss this if you're not particularly interested in the tactics and weapons being used at Napoleonic times and go straight through to part three, which covers the battle. Napoleon has rebuilt his Grand Armée, but many of his veterans were lost during the long retreat of 1812 to 1814 and particularly at the Battle of Leipzig. Napoleon's army is always divided into independent army corps. Each corps is an integrated force of all arms capable of fighting on its own and supporting itself from the countryside through which it marches. Each army corps is commanded by a field marshal who is only required to use his corps to support Napoleon's strategic aims and objectives. Napoleon only takes command at a tactical level when the whole of the Grand Army is fighting together as a single unit in a main battle. Whilst his marshals are manoeuvring independently, Napoleon has a separate and independent command called the Imperial Guard, La Garde Imperiale, which is also a mini army, it's a corps in itself, that's made up of all arms, so Napoleon has his own army as well as the Grand Army. This army corps structure has always given Napoleon massive advantages of mobility for the age. He has been able to move his corps through several routes to gather at a strategic point and bring to bear a massive force. But as they were on the march, feeding from the countryside, they could move independently and very quickly. The only problem is that the army must feed itself on the local populace. And for this campaign, that would be the French. A quick look at the type of troops and tactics of the Napoleonic age. Armies are made up of infantry, cavalry and artillery. In addition, they have supporting arms for engineering, administration, horse care, policing and signalling. And the British also have a large logistic corps because since Spain, Wellington does not feed his army from the country it's passing through, but with a supply train that buys provisions from the countries that it's occupying. At this time, however, there are no specific medical corps. Medics and religious chaplains are taken from civilian roles. Infantry usually made up about 65% of the manpower of an army. Cavalry then made about 25%. Artillery about 8% of the manpower. And the ancillary roles, including staff officers, about 2%. The infantry always marches to battle on foot. It is usually further subdivided into two categories. The main body of infantry is called the line infantry. The line infantry makes up most of any field force. And it is supported by the light infantry or the skirmishers, who in French were referred to as the voltigeurs. On the battlefield, the line infantry is usually deployed in some sort of line, whilst the light infantry forms a protective screen in front and on the flanks. 
Once battle is joined, the light infantry can also fall back into line or act as a reserve behind the main line. Almost all infantry of the day is armed with a flintlock musket loaded at the muzzle end. The French had the Chasseport musket and the British had the famous Brown Bess. The Chasseport musket fired a slightly larger musket ball, but both of them fired large calibre, low velocity, soft lead ball, which can do severe damage to the bone and soft tissue. A musket ball smashes rather than penetrates. The flintlock is delicate and needs care and maintenance, and it is prone to misfire. A socket bayonet can also be added to the musket, both for hand-to-hand -hand fighting and also to repel cavalry in the way that the pike used to in earlier forces. Massed volley fire was always far more effective than individual musket shots, but there was some risk of the enemy getting in an attack between your volleys. In fact, the Prussians just before the Napoleonic campaign used to fire their muskets from the hip because it was believed that aimed fire was no more accurate than general fire in the direction of the enemy. A mass volley fire gives the opportunity for the enemy to charge after you've discharged your muskets and take you by surprise. The way to counter this was control volley fire to spread the weight of shot over a period rather than leaving a long gap whilst reloading. Control volley fire was conducted by companies. Some firing whilst others reloaded until the enemy retreated. Volley fire by companies was a speciality of the British. The French actually preferred the volley en masse, everybody shooting together and then running in to finish off the enemy with a charge. Loading and reloading was a slow, laborious and also a slightly risky business, taking as many as 15 required steps to be completed. The risk came from ramming gunpowder into a barrel which still contained hot embers and the gunpowder would explode and if you were unlucky, blow off your arm. But the 15 steps did require quite a time to complete. And this brought the rate of fire down to only one or possibly two volleys per minute from the line infantry, which is why it was important to have other people with loaded guns whilst you were reloading yours. The light infantry usually worked in pairs and using cover and loading shortcuts, ways in which they could load without going through all the 15 steps. And this meant that they could sometimes manage up to four or five aim shots per minute each. But the British Army also used men of the Rifle Brigade in their light infantry skirmishing role. The Baker rifle had a rate of fire that at the very best was two shots per minute, but its effective range could be out to 400 yards, which was eight times more than the effective musket range in battle. The basic infantry formations for both sides were column of march, which could easily turn and form line of battle. This could then be extended and the extended line of battle could be only three or four men deep. And this was Wellington's preference. He usually trained his men to stand as a thin red line in four or five ranks across a large area of the field. 
close column of assault was a French preference and also both sides could form the infantry square. The infantry square at this time was a passive defence. It didn't move around the battlefield and was designed to repel cavalry attacks. It was vulnerable when attacked by infantry, so the idea was to force the enemy into square by threatening with cavalry and then to attack with either close column infantry or with line infantry and shoot the square to pieces. The natural tactic for a group of men fighting is to move in a block with the bravest at the front of the wedge. This was even the way in which the Romans carried out their attacks. The revolutionary French mastered this technique as deep column formations, smashing into the enemy formation like a hammerhead and scattering it. Wellington, who was always short of men, had trained his various armies to stand in a thin red line, firing quickly and keeping the enemy away and breaking up the attack. This was rather like a naval action of crossing the T, where all of Wellington's forces could attack the oncoming. Whilst the column was limited to just a few men at the front who were able to shoot back. And soon the column would begin to weaken and retire. Most of Wellington's success came in this style of fighting. The cavalry was usually classed as heavy and light, and this depended purely on the weight of the horses being used. The heavy cavalry used heavy horses up to cart horses almost, whereas the light cavalry could even be mounted on ponies. Sometimes the heavy cavalry is further divided into heavy and medium, and this depends on the type of troops that are mounted. Light cavalry includes hussars, chasseurs, cossacks, uhlans, and the like. They're mainly used away from the actual battle for scouting, foraging, and skirmishing with the enemy's light cavalry. Their main purpose is reconnaissance, and during the battle, they will provide battlefield intelligence on the enemy troop movements by moving around the battlefield and then quickly coming back to the command headquarters. The most important use of the light cavalry in battle was to pursue a broken enemy and destroy a routed force on the battlefield itself. The heavy cavalry resembled the knights of old. They were used on the battlefield as an assault weapon, charging home to break up enemy formations and smash units. Its main advantage on the battlefield was mobility and weight. It could move faster than the infantry and could hit more heavily in the charge. But it could also become isolated by moving faster than its support. And this happens in the Battle of Waterloo. The French heavy cavalry were variously called gendarmes, cuirassiers, carbonniers, grenadiers cheval, whereas the British tended to just be called horse guard regiments. Polish lancers were available to Napoleon, being a leftover of his eastern conquests that remained loyal during the Second Regime. They formed part of what is sometimes called medium cavalry, because although they were riding lightweight horses, they could charge home with the extended reach that their lances gave them. 
Dragoons are another form sometimes referred to as medium cavalry. Early dragoons were intended as mounted infantry, riding to a part of the battle where they were needed, then dismounting and fighting on foot. But soldiers on horses usually liked to stay on horses, and the bigger the horse, the better. And dragoons became medium to heavy cavalry. The basic cavalry formations for both sides were similar to those of infantry. Close column of march could quickly be turned into attack in line. But when an attack in line met a superior force, it would usually have no option but to retire. A way to overcome this was to attack in echelon. The leading unit could hit the enemy line whilst the others hang back and hold the line pinned. If the leading unit finds a weakness, then other units can charge in and exploit the break and eventually a complete breakthrough and envelopment can be achieved. But if the leading unit is withstood, then the other units in the echelon can concentrate and allow the entire force to retire intact. Cavalry can also attack in close column, particularly with heavy cavalry hitting a line of infantry like a hammer and forcing a breakthrough. The danger is that when this happens, the infantry could close ranks behind the cavalry and leave the cavalry isolated. This happens at Waterloo and frequently happened during the English Civil War when Prince Rupert would charge down the parliamentary infantry and then dash on into the background to attack the baggage whilst the parliamentary infantry recovered its ranks. So, close column of march, attack in line, close column of attack, and attack in echelon are the basic formations for cavalry. Both sides carried edged or thrusting weapons. The light cavalry tended to carry the curved sabre which allowed them to slash at the heads and soldiers of retreating troops, whilst the heavy cavalry preferred the straight broadsword, which with the arm extended could be used almost like the lance to pierce into an enemy and then retrieve the sword on the back thrust. Officers tended to carry rapier style swords and a pistol. The battlefield was not a pleasant place to be. With soft lead balls at relatively low velocities, wounds tended to smash bone out of the limb rather than drilling through as does a modern high velocity jacketed bullet. And with sword slashing wounds, severe bone trauma could also be caused and stabs can go deep and cause a great deal of damage to internal organs.
Generally speaking, wounds to limbs are likely to require amputation. Wounds to the body are likely to cause a lingering death from gangrene and other infections. And also being wounded is likely to lead to several hours or even days left on the battlefield before help arrives because there was no set up medical system at the time. Battles in the Napoleonic era are not really like the Bernard Cornwall's TV Sharp series. Maggots do not heal a compound fracture. But worst of all is the damage that can be caused by the artillery. Napoleonic field artillery is either foot or horse. Siege and shipborne artillery existed in Napoleonic times, but they are not present in the Waterloo campaign. Foot artillery travels with the infantry. Its weight of shot tends to be between 12 to 15 pounds. It's usually deployed in static batteries on the battlefield, which continue to fire for the duration of the battle. Horse artillery, on the other hand, moves with the cavalry. Its weight of shot is about six to nine pounds and the cannons are significantly lighter. Its lighter weight means it can be moved around the battlefield into trouble spots. This was the type of artillery that was first developed by Gustavus Adolphus during the Thirty Years' War in Europe. Napoleon was a qualified artillery officer, and many of his victories came from masterly artillery tactics. At this time, the artillery was the only genuinely professional arm of all armies. Promotion could not be bought in the artillery. It only came from skill and experience. All armies had artillery schools where artillery officers qualified in the mathematics and tactics of their weapon. The main weapon was the cannon, but also coming into use at this time was a weapon called the howitzer, a shorter barreled cannon that fired a different type of shot. The cannon is a long range weapon. It fires large iron balls. The effective range is about 1200 yards. A foot company usually had about eight cannons, whilst a horse company had around six. Each cannon requires a crew of at least four men to fire it. But an artillery company needs about 340 men and 180 horses to deploy it in the battlefield. A solid round shot used by the various foot and horse cannons can weigh six pounds, nine pounds, 12 pounds, or even as heavy as 15 pounds. Canister shot is a lead or tin container filled with musket balls or pistol balls, which spread out like pellets from a shotgun. The effective range of canister is from 30 to 100 yards. Grape is a canvas bag of pistol balls which bursts as it leaves the barrel and forms a lethal cloud of shot at a range of about 10 to 60 yards. Field artillery is always fired by a burning slow match touched to a touch hole. 
Naval and fortress artillery can use flintlocks, but they're considered too delicate for field artillery use. The cannon is usually aimed directly at the target. At longer ranges, ricochet or bounced fire can also be used. There is a story of a soldier at Waterloo who, seeing a spent cannonball rolling towards him, put his foot out to stop it and his leg was amputated below the knee. At close ranges of 10 to 100 yards, grape and cannon shot can wreak serious damage. Both act like shotgun shells. Grape spreads quickly. Canister takes a little longer and therefore can reach a little further out. Both are exceedingly useful against cavalry because they can take out the horse and the man together. A battery of guns fired into a mass of infantry can do obvious and massive damage. The momentum of the cannonballs mean they go through their targets, clearing lanes in the enemy troops. And firing obliquely can cause even more damage. Direct fire causes far fewer casualties when the target is deployed in line or extended line. And this is why Wellington usually occupied a defensive position and deployed in line. French Elan usually meant they attacked at speed and deployed in column d'assault. Both sides had foot and horse howitzers. This was a relatively new weapon that fired an explosive shell or bomb. The bomb was a hollow ball packed with powder fired by an ignition fuse so that it exploded and showered shell fragments around the area. The shells were filled with explosive powder at the gun site just before they were fired. Howitzers fired indirectly, but with limited accuracy. The indirect fire of a howitzer was very difficult to range before fixed ammunition was invented. If you put a little too much gunpowder into the charge or a little too little into the charge, the shell would either go over the enemy or would fall short and the effect would be lost. At this time, howitzers could not fire ball and cannon could not fire shell, excepting that the British could fire something called shrapnel shells from their cannons and howitzers. The shrapnel shell, invented by an artillery officer of the same name, was actually pre-manufactured as a strong hollow ball pre-loaded with powder and musket balls that spread out when the shell exploded. They spread out as shrapnel. And because the shrapnel shell is manufactured, it can be timed to explode in midair.
In general, Napoleonic battles still employ classical tactics and formations to move and organize the three arms in the field. Infantry, cavalry and artillery. It's likely that the Caesars would recognize the battle moves and keep pace with the action, but industrial technology is just beginning to have an impact. So, we'll see you at the battle. That concludes part two of this Waterloo 1815 programme. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us for part three when we'll look at the battle itself. Just one more part to come. See you there.